Hello, my name is Tom Schaefer. I'm pastor of Faith United Lutheran Church in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, this is the first Sunday of Lent, uh, what the uh, uh, ancient uh, church forebears called the springtime of the soul, a time for spiritual growth, and we're glad to have you join us here for Faith United Online. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion, fountain of living water. Pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace, 
by the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Compassionate God, how easily you love those who look unlovable to us. How readily you welcome undesirables into your home. How slow we are to follow your example. Turn our hearts toward all who are considered outcast, shunned, and unclean, so that we may love our neighbor without pity or apathy, for the sake of the one who became flesh to cleanse the world of sin and death forever. Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Now, Lent is a time, among other things, uh, it's a time for change, to make positive changes, to make good changes in our life and in this world. And um, I can't help but thinking about, in our country, how the current socio-political environment is pretty ugly. And my concern is that we seem to have lost the ability to have empathy for anyone who sees things differently than we do. My friend and mentor, Dr. Uh, Kent Hunter of Church Doctor Ministries says, we have lost civility. In, in his newest book, Restoring Civility, Dr. Hunter says, Jesus taught about building a house on a stone foundation, whether the society acts in a civil or uncivil way reflects the foundation. A person without civility will collapse in the face of storms. The same is true of society. And then Kent goes on to say this, where you sow civility, you harvest harmony. Where you invest in harmony, you experience community. Jesus teaches us this, and that the key is how you look at yourself and how you look at others, especially those you might consider your enemies. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And now, in some translations, it says that uh, uh, it is a lawyer who stood up. But what we know is, is that he was an expert in interpreting Jewish law. That's who this individual was. And he asks a question, but he has no intention of really learning from Jesus because it tells us that this is a person with an agenda, that his purpose was to test Jesus, not to learn something, but to test Jesus. He wants to judge the authority of the so-called teacher. But Jesus quickly and deftly turns the tide. 
Verse 26. What is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have correctly answered, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. Now notice what Jesus does here. He knows the motive of this person. He's not really looking for answers. So Jesus turns the question back on the expert. How do you read the law? So the guy answers and Jesus says, you have answered correctly. The expert wanted Jesus to prove himself and suddenly the expert finds himself proving himself to Jesus. And Jesus tells him, good job. But then we see something else here that happens throughout this encounter. Jesus never actually answers the question the expert has asked him. The expert says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But Jesus says, do this and you will live. Essentially, by this question that was intended to test and his subsequent answer, the expert reveals that what he is looking for is a formula. In a way, what he's looking for is the bare minimum. What must I do to inherit eternal life later? What must I do now to inherit eternal life later? And this view of eternal life is faulty, and here's why. If you look up the definition for eternal, it means existing forever without beginning and without end. So the question is not what must I do now to inherit eternal life later, but what does it look like to live this life now? So if you love the Lord and love your neighbor, you will live in the fullest sense of the word. You will have abundant life. You will be living the eternal life. Now the expert who wanted to judge Jesus feels like he has to defend his position at this point. Listen, verse 29. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, something the expert knew that we need to understand was the Old Testament Jewish understanding of who your neighbor was. And we're going to take a look at at, at two Old Testament passages to help us with this. First, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. It says there, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And then in Leviticus 19, verse 18, it says this. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. So this is where the two laws come from, from Deuteronomy 6 and from Leviticus 19. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor. But here in Leviticus 19, listen to what it says again. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You see, in the second command, God was teaching the people of Israel how to be a holy community. Neighbor in Leviticus 19 was here constituted specifically as the people of your own tribe. The Greeks would say the word oikos, uh, household. We would say friends and family. We should love them as ourselves, but Jesus does not want us to just fulfill the letter of the law. He wants us to reflect the very heart and will of God, and so he tells a story to make this point. Verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, where he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came 
to the place and saw him passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he put the man on his donkey, took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now first, I want you to notice a few things about the one who needs love shown to him in this story. We know nothing about him. We don't know who he is, what he does, what tribe he belongs to. You can't even tell by what he's wearing because he's been stripped and beaten. There is no way to put a definition of, the, of neighbor on this person. He is simply someone in need of the compassion of another. Now, the next two characters in the story are clearly identified. One's a Levite and one's a priest, two religious figures. And yet they both give wide birth to this person. They ignore him. Clearly, they don't see this person as their neighbor. Now, there's much conjecture about why they pass by him, uh, that perhaps they thought that this was a, a, a trap. It wasn't safe for them to stop. They thought that this person may have been dead and therefore he would be unclean for a Jew to touch. In the end, though, there's no good excuse. Even the Jewish religious laws allowed the preservation of life to trump all other laws that would forbid you to help. Bottom line, they didn't feel this person was their responsibility. Now, stories like this that Jesus tells here were often told with these pattern of threes. And so the, the, the listeners would have known that after hearing the first two who had passed by, that the third person was going to be the most important person, the person that would teach the moral of the story. And so who is it? Who is the third person that comes by? Well, lo and behold, it's a Samaritan. Now, a Samaritan was no neighbor to any Jew. Even his disciples must have been shocked uh, by this story as they and Jesus were just refused housing in a Samaritan village uh, shortly before this. The disdain between Jews and Samaritans was bigger than the current gulf between Republicans and Democrats. It was prejudice that had existed in their culture for hundreds of years. Now this Samaritan stops, risking himself, tends to the wounds, takes him to an inn, sees that he is cared for, and essentially gives the innkeeper a blank check to make sure it happens. And now the big switcheroo happens. Remember I told you that Jesus never answers the question the expert has asked him. So the expert asked, to whom must I do neighborly things? To whom must I be a, a neighbor? Now listen to what Jesus says. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Jesus turns the story from who is my neighbor to how do you be a neighbor? How do you be a neighbor to others. Don't worry about defining who is your neighbor. Just be a neighbor. Show love to others, whether they're part of your tribe or not. Jesus has extended our tribe to be 
every and any person we may see. We are to be conduits of love and mercy to every person we meet. I must wonder if the disciples thought of this story when Jesus was stripped and beaten. Did, did they hear the story differently, more poignantly? Jesus saying, will you be the good Samaritan, the one who shows love to me? There is in it echoes of another story that Jesus told in Matthew 25. L listen to this. It starts at verse 34 of that chapter. Jesus said, then the king will say to those on the right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come, come to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Whenever we show love to another, we show it to Jesus. But there's also yet another way to look at the story. You see, the Samaritan is the example of godly love. The Samaritan is the image of God, the image of Jesus. The despised one is the true neighbor. Can you look at the person across the aisle that way? Can you look at the person you consider your enemy and see them as your neighbor? Can you accept the hand of that person in a time of need in a time of help, can you accept it in friendship? Because that is the kind of community Jesus wants for us. But our prejudices have robbed us from seeing the humanity of all. Our apathy for those different than us has beaten down the empathy we should have for every human being. Our camaraderie with disrespect has left civility dying on the side of the road. Now we can change this. We can make a difference. But it starts with you. Are you going to keep on walking down the road that our society is currently walking down? Robbed of love. Robbed of civility. Robbed of the ability to care for others despite our differences? Or are you going to stop and take the hand of love and nurture it back to health in this country, one neighbor at a time? Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy beloved, free to serve your neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing. In the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity, amen. Thank you for joining us this week. Um, I felt this was an important message. I hope you did too. And I hope that we as a country can start uh, living uh, the Good Samaritan way, living as a neighbor for one another. Uh, please take a moment and subscribe to our channel. Hit the notification bell so that you'll receive notice when new videos come up. And uh, if you feel led to, please do share this video with somebody else. Until next week, God bless. Keep safe.